Thank you. It sounds like a very, very nice idea. It's not all about rules. It's about planting. How in the world do I plant? What does that even mean? So just to throw out a few basic ideas. Imagine if I could convey to my child a belief that he or she has unique talents and abilities. Imagine if I could convey to my child the belief that he or she is worthy of another person having confidence in them. Basic ideas, right? Is, isn't that what we want? Think about the goals at the beginning. We want to raise children who believe in themselves. So theoretically speaking, again, it's, this is playing the long game, not the short game. But conceptually, we need to give our children space. How can my children ever find their talents and ever feel that they're truly believed in if they have no space, if they never have the opportunity to make decisions for themselves? Our children have to make decisions. Our children have to make mistakes. If I make sure that my child never does anything wrong, a, I'm conveying to my child that I can't give them the freedom to ever explore for themselves. And B, if I even would succeed in making sure they never do anything wrong, I've never given them the experience of messing up and fixing it afterwards. My children have to make mistakes. I have to let them make mistakes. I have to speak to my child that my child is a human being and not an item to give orders to. Just, again, all of this stuff is easier said than done, but just to think about it. You tell your child not to do X. What's the classic response that your child says when you tell them not to do X? Why? What is the easy response when our child asks us why they can't do X? I'll say it. You don't have to say it. Because I said so. What did I teach my child just then? The only thing I taught my child is they better listen to me. What does that do for them down the road? Now, I don't mean, obviously, there are many circumstances in life. First of all, we have to know our own limitations. And many times, I just don't have the energy. Yes, so the answer will be because I said so. And obviously, many things are so important. But the fact that something's important doesn't mean you can't explain it. To the contrary, if I explain to my child why they can't do that, they understand it much better. The more important it is, the more important it is for me to explain to my child why it's so. Doesn't that logically make sense? Just, just to think about that for a moment. Imagine if I could understand my children's strengths and weaknesses. What an amazing, what a much, how better of a parent would I be if I have an appreciation for what my child is good at? If I have an appreciation for my child's shortcomings, not in a critical way, not in a way making the child feel like they're a good for nothing, but in a way that I can put my child in a position to succeed. And then the next step is, imagine if I can help my child see for him or herself that they have this ability that they're so good at this or they're so good at that. These are all long-term goals. And I, and humbly, I don't think anybody has the, the three steps to make all these goals happen. But I think what's very, very clear is absolute total control of what my child is doing at all times is not the solution to bringing about these goals. So, Along these lines, I just want to make another point, which is maybe an uncomfortable question. What's the definition of a bad parent? So uh, clearly the first answer is not me, right? But, but what's the definition of someone else being a bad parent? So many people, whether we believe it or not, instinctively think that the definition of a bad parent is someone who doesn't have control of their child at all times. Based on everything we've said, that's preposterous. So I ask you, you're in shaloms and you're pushing the shopping cart and your child has a meltdown. 
What is the most basic thing going through your mind while your child is having a meltdown? I have to stop this meltdown immediately. This is the most embarrassing thing. They're all staring at me. So here's the reality. All of these people either have children who have meltdowns just like yours, had children who have who had meltdowns just like yours, or don't remember or haven't had the opportunity to have a child. It's that simple. So I, I don't mean that we should celebrate our child's meltdown in the middle of shaloms. And obviously part of being a parent is probably getting my child to calm down. But it's not the end of the world if my child has a meltdown. And candidly, the more we internalize that idea, I don't know about any of you, if I've said it to any of you in public places, I apologize if, if, if I rubbed you the wrong way. I'll tell you what I say to people when I see their child having a meltdown, once it's calmed down a little, but not in the moment. What I say to them is, I can't tell you how good that made me feel. <laughs> because all of us experience the same thing, right? So, so just on, on a basic level, the more I can internalize, it's not the end of the world if people see that I'm not in total control of my child. The more I really believe that, the more I'm likely to actually parent even better than I'm doing right now. And what I do want to talk about a little bit later this evening, humbly, is my idea of what it is to be a bad parent. And again, none of us are perfect. But what I would be embarrassed about philosophically as a parent is if someone told me I didn't pay appropriate attention to my child's needs. Not if someone told me I didn't pay pay appropriate attention to my child's behavior. But if someone told me I didn't pay appropriate attention to my child's needs, that would hurt me to my core. Uh, Before I go on to the next sort of subtopic, um, I just want to share with you a beautiful quote I once heard in the name of Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. And that is that the things worthy of putting your foot down with your child are anything that you could imagine them doing at the chuppah. In other words, if your young child is doing X and you say to yourself, if I don't teach my child that this is not okay, maybe they'll do it as an adult. That's something that it's very important as a parent to educate your child and to convey that you can't be doing that. But something that logically they're not going to be doing at the chuppah anyway Okay, so you have to decide, do you have to stop the child in the moment or not? But that's not core to what we need to stop our children from doing. So just to give two theoretical examples, my guess is, to just revisit the first example, my guess is most people probably wouldn't be having a meltdown as they walk down to their chuppah. Hopefully not. But imagine if my child says something hurtful to another child. Now, again, I don't mean that the responses start screaming your head off at the child. Of course not. But unfortunately, there are many adults walking around this world who regularly say hurtful things to each other. So that's something, wow. That's something I really have to figure out how I'm going to teach my child, how I'm going to explain to my child, not hit them because they said something, not scream at them because they said something, but teach them why it should be that they shouldn't say such things. That's an essential point. The behavior of the moment. So it's probably because they're tired anyway. So I have to deal with it. I have to figure out how to get out of shaloms, you know, with minimal with minimal damage. But it's not a crisis. Okay, that's like, so just to sum up the first point, I guess the first point is it's really worthwhile once in a blue moon to take a step back and ask myself, what are really my goals as a parent? What are the short-term issues I just have to deal with? And what's the long game? Okay, that's point number one. Point number two. I don't know about any of you, but I'm not a perfect human being. Okay, and with all due respect, my guess is that at least 90% of you are not perfect human beings. Okay, now logically that means that my children are not perfect human beings. And my children are not supposed to be perfect human beings. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives me all kinds of challenges in life. And one of the greatest challenges he gives each of us who are 
Zohar to be on this Zoom. Many people don't have the schus, but we have the schus. He gives us the challenge to raise children in this world. That is a tremendous challenge. It's a tremendous pressure. It's a tremendous drain of our energy. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu has entrusted us to do the best we can on helping our children grow as human beings and to truly develop. Which means the more I recognize that A, my child was not born perfect, and B, my child is never going to be perfect, the more I can figure out what's worth addressing and what's worth ignoring for now, the more I can understand that my child's role in life is not to bring me nachas. Okay? My child's role in life is not to bring me nachas. If my child is not as successful in school as other people's children, if my child does not get the alphabet as quickly as other people's children, if my child misbehaves in school, that's who they are. That's their challenge. That's my job to figure it out and to help them figure it out. There's no reason for me to be angry at them because they're not bringing me nachas. It's not their job to bring me nachas. It's my job to help them grow. And the more I internalize that idea, the more I'm ready for the, uh, the following basic concept. Imagine the following scenario. You're minding your own business. It's been a long day. Many of us have jobs. Even those of us who don't have jobs, we're probably very tired dealing with our children. The phone rings. We pick up the phone. It's somebody from school or, or from the of child care, whatever it is. And they're telling me, not only are they telling me that my child misbehaved today, but they're actually telling me that my child has a concrete issue and they'd like me to come in for a meeting. Okay? I've had that experience. I guess as some of you have had that experience. I come into the meeting. What is my emotion when I come into the meeting? For so many of us, our knee-jerk reaction is that we have to defend our child. And if they tell me that my child is different than anyone else's child, or my child has some lacking, they're attacking my child and they're attacking me. If I firmly believe that my child is not perfect and it's my avoda, it's my job in this world to help my child grow, then I should be thanking the teacher for taking the time. And I don't mean it because of etiquette. I mean it really. I should be thanking the teacher for taking the time to care enough about my child to notice something and to take the time to share it with me. Because I know my child's not perfect. My job is to figure out how to improve, how to help my child grow. And I don't have the experience that the teachers have. And I certainly don't have the unbiased view that the teachers have. But if I can't, if I don't have that idea clear in my mind that my child isn't perfect, I'm going to have a very hard time when the teacher calls me in for a meeting. Is it possible the teacher is mistaken? Of course it's possible the teacher is mistaken. Nobody knows it all. It's fine to, to disagree with the teacher and to want to go to some expert in the field or a second opinion, that's all fine and well. Maybe the teacher needs to broaden their perspective. Let me share what happens at home. But I'll, I'll just share with you that I've had experiences where teachers have made comments to us and we've checked it out with specialists and Baruch Hashem, it's okay. I've had experiences where no one has ever made a comment to us and my wife or I have noticed things and we've checked it out with specialists and we're correct that there, that there was an issue. And to be honest with you, it's not, it's not a complaint, but we probably would have been even better off if someone would have flagged it for us earlier along the way. It's a bracha. It's a bracha if someone flags it for you. And there's no reason to take it as an accusation. Along these lines, I just want to think about another scenario. 
And maybe this is a little bit further down the road for some people, but probably not that much further down the road. Imagine your child comes home, or maybe it's not even your child comes home. Maybe you see your children together and it's very obvious. Imagine if it's apparent that there are other children in the class who are better at something than your child. What's probably appropriate for this age group is imagine if your child is not getting reading like other people's children are getting. So it's the same point. Every child has needs. So maybe your child's needs is that they're not good at reading. I don't know, maybe they need some extra help. Maybe they're never going to be as good at reading as other children. I don't know. Everyone's good at different things and less good at other things. I don't know. Does it anger me? Does it frustrate me that my child is not good at reading? Then my child comes to me and tells me it. And they tell me, but I'm so upset because other children in the class are further along in reading than I am. So how do I feel when I hear that? Most parents, I think feel one of two emotions. Some of us feel um, sadness for our child, that, that oy vey, it's so sad that they're behind. Some of us feel uh, jealousy of the other people's child. That happens too. Jealousy is a very real emotion. And we're trying to be good parents and we sort of need to like mask these emotions in some way. Imagine if honest to goodness, we could honest to goodness believe that's so wonderful that those children can read and we're gonna work on your needs, but your needs is a separate partial than their needs. Imagine if we could really believe that. It's not just we wouldn't feel awkward in front of our child. That's chinuch. Imagine how many of us right now, forget our children, how many of us right now are struggling with other people having more than we have? How many of us are struggling with people that were have, get, getting the promotion that we didn't get? How many of us are struggling with people who have more money than we have? How many of us are struggling with people who have more friends than we have? How many of us are struggling with people who have more children than we have? The list is, is unending. How many of us are struggling with jealousy right now? Could you imagine if our children could grow up with the firm belief that our children know, our children know when we're faking and when we mean it, can you imagine the chinuch that our children would have if from a young age they pointed out that they weren't as far along as their friends and that was fine by us? I assure you that's much more important chinuch than making sure that my child is always well-behaved in shaloms. Much more important. I want to share with you one of the nicest compliments that my wife or I have ever received in our lives. Um, and it's not that my speech was short. I, generally speaking, don't get that compliment. But um, one of the nicest compliments that my wife or I ever received is we once received a call from school about one of our children. And, you know, that our children did something inappropriate. Okay, that's life. And then the teacher said to us, full disclosure, your child was not the only child who did this. There was another child who did the same thing that your child did. And full disclosure, we're not calling the other parents. And the reason we decided to call you is I spoke to the administrator and it wasn't a big, big deal, but we thought it was worth contacting the parents. And the administrator said, if you call the Rosenbaums, they'll actually appreciate it. If you call the other people, it won't be worth it. I'm telling you as a parent, that means so much more to me than my children are well-behaved in Shalom's. And, and, and again, I don't, get the, I don't get that compliment often, so hopefully I'm living up to that. But, but it, I just think it's a basic thing to think about. And I wanna say one more thing before we go on to the next topic. If anyone were to ever tell you that your child should see a therapist, that is a wonderful opportunity. It's very important. There's much less of a stigma with therapy today than there was 20 years ago but we need to keep on working on it. Uh, I've had children go to therapists for different things. Mechaste uh, Hashem, all the times that we've sent our children to therapists, we've been blessed to send to wonderful therapists who really understood our child. 
And in each case, our children are so much further along the development because they went to such a wonderful therapist. I don't mean that every therapist is wonderful. I don't mean every therapist connects with every child. What can I tell you? We've, we've been very fortunate. Hashem has, has, has blessed our efforts. But all I'll tell you is in each circumstance, I look back and I say to myself, I don't, I don't know where we'd be today if we hadn't have gone to that therapist. And again, many, many times, just to connect back to what we spoke about before, it's not us that see it. It's someone else who doesn't have our bias that sees it. Don't waste the time and energy arguing with people over how perfect your child is. Just take the feedback and, and do what you can to, to, to help your child grow. That's humbly, I, I try to live to that. Okay, I told you I was going to speak for, for 30 minutes and, and I'm, uh, I'm at about five minutes now. So I want to move on to the last major point and then we'll open it up for comments. Um, where do, where's our role in the children's religious development? Just broadly speaking, we've spoken a lot about the children's emotional development. We haven't said anything about religious spiritual development. So here's what I want to say, and I don't know if everyone would agree with me, but this is my own view. We have wonderful schools in the community. I, I, I see I want to uh, welcome uh, Shomri Nursery's, Shomri Preschool's new, ner new director, Mrs. Sarah Dolman. We're very uh, happy to have her. Um, we have wonderful schools in our community. We really do whether it be on the nursery school level, would be on the elementary school level, wonderful schools. I, I personally am of the belief that it's not my job nor my wife's job to teach my children. And I just want to tell you, just in case anyone doesn't know, my wife has been in, in Limurei Kodesh Chinuch for over 20 years. Uh, she taught in the Torah school. She teaches in the Yeshiva Girls High School now. She's taught multiple grades. Uh, I've been in Chinuch, though, at an older end, but I've been in Chinuch myself for a number of years. We don't think it's our job to teach our kids. We're, we're very happy to have faith in the local schools. So what do we see as our job? Now, obviously, if the school tells us we should be working on X or Y with our child, that's working in tandem with the school. That is our job. But we don't need to forge a whole new curriculum for our children in, in their learning. So many people ask me at the Seder how they're supposed to deal with it. It's the craziest thing. We have a mitzvah from the Torah to teach our children about the Exodus at the Seder. And most of us have a few minutes here and there to prepare for the Seder. And our children, if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, just wait a few years. Our children come with these bulging notebooks and like they're going to give us like these shiurim on, on Pesach and we're supposed to be teaching them. What are we supposed to do with that? And I'll tell you what I tell people all the time very briefly there's two aspects of chinuch in Torah. There's knowledge and there's attitude towards Torah. Our teachers, by and large, cannot be mechanich our children in attitude towards Torah nearly as well as we can. And there's a few reasons for that. Our children, whether they know it or not, as more years progress, it'll become more clear to them. Think of yourselves. The bottom line is we think of the home in which we're raised as our base, that everything starts from there. We think of our parents, subconsciously, we think of our parents as the people in the world who have the most connection to who we ultimately want to be as people. The teachers in school are very, very nice, but it's their job to be excited about the subject matter. It's not my parents' job to be excited about the subject matter. What excites my parents? When I'm a child and I'm sitting at the Shabbos table and I tell my parents what I learned in the Parsha, again, think about what we started with. Do my parents see me as people? Do my parents see me as people who, who are growing, et cetera? Or do my parents just see me as something sitting at, at, at the table there? If I could share what I learned about the Parsha with my parents and my parents are impressed by it, not impressed by how brilliant I am. Maybe yes, maybe no. But they're impressed that I know it and they're impressed that I'm interested in it. And it's clear that they think it's important. I'm more inclined to find it important myself. Believe me, I, I, to be very blunt, my guess is I can run rings around half of my children's teachers on the Torah subjects that they teach them. That's my guess. But I don't need to teach them anymore. 
I just want to know what they learned in school. If, by the way, if they feel like telling it to me, if they don't feel like telling it to me, I don't want it to become a pressure point. I don't want it to become a point of stress to them. If the teacher tells me that they need to review, I, I ask them to review with me, but that's, that's a little bit down the road, I think. If the child wants to tell me their partial questions, I am all focused on my child. And, and I'm telling you, if they get the right answer, I am so excited. And if they get the wrong answer, that's perfectly fine. And I, if they, I'll tell them what the right answer is, whatever, but that's not what it's about. And if my child doesn't feel like doing with the partial with me, that's fine too, whatever the child wants. But that is an opportunity for the child to see my excitement in what they're doing in Yiddishkeit. I just, uh, forgive me, just a minute or two more. There are regular things that our children can see our excitement and can feel excitement for what happens in our homes with Yiddishkeit. And I think it can penetrate our children. The Shabbos table. The Shabbos table has the potential to be a stressful thing for a child. I do not require anything of my younger children at the Shabbos table. And even my older children, I, I ask them to be there for Kiddush and Motsi. They are singing, they're not singing, they want to tell me it's Vara Torah, they don't want to tell me it's Vara Torah, whatever. But my children know that Friday night in my house is the most exciting time of the week because Shalom Aleichem is a production in my house. I, I, I dance, I sing, and some of my children have no interest in it, and some of my children are extremely excited in it. Now, if none of my children were excited in it, my guess is I would stop, but I still have some customers, so I keep on doing it. But my, 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 my two-year-old, my two-year-old was all upset this past Shabbos lunch that I wasn't starting with Shalom Aleichem. And I told her Shalom Aleichem is, is, is a special thing for, for Friday night. So I, it's not that my children are, are innately excited about singing Shalom Aleichem. I make it exciting. Now, in another house, something else will be exciting. We have to know our customers. But to make it something special, and it's about them. Um, COVID, COVID has been very challenging for my family in all kinds of ways. But I'll tell you one way that it's been amazing we regularly have guests at our Shabbos table. We haven't been having guests at our Shabbos table. It is utterly, totally about whatever my children want to talk about. And I try to give them a spot at the table even when we have guests, but I have to in some way interact with my guests. Now, my wife and I, if my, some, and by the way, sometimes my children have no interest in us and they just want to go play with each other. And then my wife and I can actually talk and that's great. But Many times this child wants to act out the makos and that child wants the partial questions and that child wants to act out something I have no idea what in the world they're talking about and half of it doesn't make any sense. But it's a Torah thing and they feel good about it. So that's amazing. So I don't want to talk too long, but that's the third point. The third point is I think our primary role is to generate excitement for our children in their Yiddishkeit by modeling and not telling them why aren't you inspired, but just going with the flow, but trying the, the avenues that we see, trying to make things exciting for them. And hopefully they see our excitement and they respond to that. So just to sum up the main topics that I humbly would suggest, the first thing is to have in mind what's really important, what's not so important. The second thing is to remember our children are flawed and it's our God-given responsibility to do what we can for them. And the third, I don't think our role is to teach them kola Torah kula. I think our role is to give them an appreciation and excitement for Torah subjects, uh, for Yiddishkeit, I'm sorry, more from an emotional perspective. Um, what I'd like to do now is switch gears and take some of the comments that have come in in the chat. Um, one person was kind enough to submit a question ahead of time. Uh, I think this is an extremely relevant question for many of us, um, the question was, one aspect of the question, you'll forgive me, I, 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 uh, the person submitted it anonymously, um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss with you offline if you'd like, but I think it really varies based on the situation. But the broader part of your question is I think very common, which is how does one deal with educating children about less, less observant family members? 
family members that aren't Shomer Shabbos. You have, fa- you know, family members that don't keep kosher. How do you deal with that? It, 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 they're not living up to what we're focusing on and how does that work? So I, I'll tell you something. I tell people all the time, um, I think it's a big bracha if we have s- people in our lives that are not as observant as we are. Um, I think many, many ways we live in a little bit of a cocoon today. Baruch Hashem, we have such a large firm community. Uh, almost all of our children's friends are, are from Shabbos and kosher and all that. Um, there's a whole world out there. There's a whole world of Jews. There's a whole world of non-Jews. I think it's a powerful thing to, on some level, have a concept of interacting. We, our next door neighbor, they're not Jewish. Um, they have grandchildren who very frequently are at their house. Uh, we encourage our kids to play with them. You know, and obviously we have to be, you know, we have to be on top of certain things, but we encourage our kids to play with them. I think it's good. Um, so I think in the context of how do we relate to less observant people, whether friends, whether it be family. So I, I think the basic, I think the basic message is that we're so lucky to have the Torah and to understand the Torah the way we do. And so-and-so doesn't understand the Torah as much as we do. And they're doing what they think is right. And we're so lucky that we have, that we, we, we're lucky enough. You go to this wonderful school that you go to. We went to wonderful schools. We know more. And because we understand what we do, we do what we do. And the implicit message being, we are no better than those people because we're not better than those people. We're just luckier that we have the additional knowledge and perspective that they're not, they don't merit to have. I, I think that's the way to do it. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of specific questions. If you expose a child to this, expose a child to that. I think that really has to be on a case by case basis. But on a broad level, I think that's the approach. Um, that's what I would recommend. Oh, gosh. What a good question. Um, how does one teach their four year old not to constantly physically hurt the two year old sibling? Um, I think there are uh, two ways, broadly speaking. Uh, and again, all of this, take it or leave it. I don't, I repeat, I, I'm just kind of sharing some thoughts. I don't pretend to be an expert. Um, we did speak about the value of structure. So I think there's a certain level of um, don't do that. But I think there's something to be said for explaining. Uh, and obviously, by the way, if you do that, there can be repercussions, You know, whether you have to be by yourself a classic thing that's spoken about so much by people far wiser than myself. It's not that you have to go to your room because we're punishing you. Punishment is normally discouraged. Uh, This is just the the natural, um, the word is escaping me. This is just the natural uh, result, but there's a better word. It's just the natural result of what you did. If you're going to hit your sibling, you can't be in this public place because it's not fair to your sibling to be hit. So you're going to have to go to the other room until you can calm down, not because we're punishing you, because it's just not feasible to have you here right now. Um, in terms of explaining why it's not okay, I think the basic idea is we you wouldn't like if someone did that to you, so you shouldn't be doing that to them. Now, they're not gonna get it because it's not fun to not hit your, your sibling, so fine. So then they have to learn from the, what the repercussions are. The repercussions are, they're gonna have to have alone time. I'm, 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 I'm sure wiser people could give better answers, but that's humbly what I would say. Um, a very powerful question. Someone asked about the possibility that the kids will get uh, too attached to culture, internet, movies, TV. Um, I think that requires a lot of wisdom. Um, I think it requires a lot of limitation. I think the, the real answer for how to do that is above my pay grade, but on, on, a, on a basic level, um, I think limits is an extremely healthy thing to impose in our children's lives in general, in all aspects of life. Right, I, 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 I look the way I do because I don't live with enough limits in how I eat. I, I work on that. Many of us are working on that. But limits is an important part of life in all kinds of ways. Um, so uh, limits is, is probably a very healthy thing. And so again, I'm, I'm sure we could have three lectures about that topic. It's a very important topic. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I don't feel comfortable commenting uh, on specific schools I'm happy to discuss further, but uh, natural consequence, consequence. Thank you very much, Moshe Kaplan. Consequence, that we're not punishing you, but it's, it's, it's the consequence. Gosh, 
What a wonderful question. Someone submitted, um, how do we model teach behavior to our children that we ourselves might have difficulty with? So let's say, um, let's say a person has difficulty with being patient and they wanna teach their child to be better at being patient, but how are they gonna teach their child to be better at being patient? It's like borderline hypocritical. That is a wonderful question. Okay, so I wanna share with you uh, a very powerful thing I learned from one of the therapists that has helped our family in, in an amazing way. And without going into detail, um, there was a certain child who we were having certain challenges with, with the therapist. And this therapist, much, much, much to their credit, was able to slowly, slowly, slowly navigate without obviously doing so to get me to say the words that I think I model, or at least my character is inclined in the same direction that this child's character is inclined, right? In other words, if I have certain shortcomings, there's this genetic thing. So it's very possible that my child will have a similar shortcoming to something that I have or live with a similar challenge that I live with. And, you know, that was like a little bit of an epiphany for me, I think, because it meant that I wasn't perfect, which was like, you know, a shocker for me. Um, but then the therapist said an amazing thing to me. The therapist said, imagine if you could share with your child that this issue is a challenge for you as well. And you need to work on it too. I'm telling you, it was such a meaningful thing. It was such a meaningful thing. I'm telling you, I have a stronger connection with this child today than I ever did before. Um, and the fact that, so the fact that I bared myself to my child in that way was remarkable for my child. Um, I was totally treating my child like a human being, by the way, not an equal. I'm the parent. This is not like, Call me David. We're in this together. None of that business. But but I'm the parent, but I want to teach the child from my experiences. The child felt so validated. And the child still grapples with this. But guess what? The parent still grapples with it also. But I I I think I think it's an amazing thing. I'll also share with you Loa Lenu. We shouldn't, we shouldn't know from such things, but um one of the wisest pieces of, of advice I ever received. And I, I share this with parents of children of all ages. Um, when I was a high school Rebbe, um, my sheer experienced a terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, there was a, a, a boy in my sheer passed away. And um, a wonderful therapist from High Lifeline uh, really was a tremendous resource to me to help my sheer deal with it. Um, and reinforce certain points that were being conveyed, et cetera. And the person said to me such a powerful thing. Um, it's a very powerful thing to share emotions with our children. Again, not to lose our composure, but, and I, I, I sometimes have said this to my children to voice, again, it has to be age appropriate and every situation is different. I'm not sure this is necessarily age appropriate for this thing, but it's probably worth thinking about. There have been times where I've said to my children, you know, this thing that we're talking about makes me sad. It makes me sad. And it's it's okay to be sad. A validator of emotions. Our children shouldn't see us as perfect beings. First of all, they know better than we think they do how imperfect we are. That's the first thing they know very well. Our children need to see us as guides along the path. And actually, if we can admit that we're not perfect and that we're working on certain things, again, not not bearing ourselves in ways that make the child uncomfortable, but at a basic level, that's hard for me. That's hard for me too sometimes. And I work on it and I'm so much better at it than I used to be. It's tremendous modeling. I, I, I hope that answer made a little bit of sense. Thank you for raising it. Um, and thank you to all the people who submitted chats. Any other comments in the chat box before people, before we go on to a few more comments? Okay. I just want to close with a few few concrete things. Um, one thing is, and I'm so sorry to even say the words, but it's really important. Um, we live in a scary world and we all know that and our children are not immune from that. 
And there are sick people in this world and there are sick people in the firm community. And um, it's very important to be aware that Rahman al Islam, terrible abuses happen within the Orthodox community as well. Um, I humbly, there are two things that we can do, even at a young age, to hope, hopefully, protect our children if Rahman al Islam they would ever have such a situation. One thing is there's a great book, and I'm sure there's more than what I just happen to know of one. There's a great book from Art Scroll. It's called Let's Stay Safe. It is a wonderful book. And I don't know if it's for two-year-olds, but I definitely I, I could check it out for yourself. It's available. It, there's it's certainly write-ups about it online. Let's stay safe from Art Scroll. I'm sure once a child is like six, it's age appropriate. And it's awesome. Because what it does is it gives all these tips in a friendly child. It's a very, it's a very uh, aesthetically pleasing pictures, all kinds of things to be careful about in life. You know, there's fires and there's stoves and there's looking both ways before you cross the street. All the kinds of stuff that we want our children to be aware of as they get older. And they have very carefully nestled in there things like, it's not appropriate for people to touch me in places that I normally have covered. If I, you know, I, I, I don't want to take all the time now, but it's so chachmadik because the scariest thing is if chas v'shalom, something would happen to a child, would a child even understand that there was something strange that happened to them? And so this is a very subtle way to convey the point. And as children get older, there are educational things in school, but this is even from a young age, I think a good way to do it. And the second thing is so much more important, humbly speaking, and it's really planting seeds. Do you know what one of the most classic things that Rahman al abusive people convince children of? They convince them that if they tell anybody, their parents, A, won't believe them, and B, will be angry at them. It's classic. Check it out. It's, 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 it's all over literature. Which means that if I can somehow, some way, build a relationship with my child, that they know they can talk to me if something happened in their life and I will accept what they say with love. I might tell them that wasn't appropriate. I might even have to punish them for or give them consequences, thank you, Moshe Kaplan, for what they did. But I thank them for telling me it and I, and I, and I, and I accept what they say and I don't you know, throw them out as telling me ridiculous things. If they tell me that about the most basic things at this young age, I am planting seeds in my relationship with them that they can tell me anything. And Rahman al if a child is a teenager and they feel tremendous peer pressure about drugs and they don't know what to do about it, or they hate themselves for one reason or another and they have nowhere to turn, could you imagine how amazing it would be if they felt they could turn to you? Do you know how much you're helping them in their lives? But this is not something that it's the time to do at 15 years old. Hello, I'm your parent. I love you very much. You should just know that anything you ever want to share with me, I'm there for you. Here's my card. That's not, it's not going to work. This is the time. This is, this is, this is seed planting now. Again, we could give three talks about this and people far more qualified than myself. But believe me, so much of this is planting the seeds now. And it's not only Rahman al Islam for abuse and drugs, it's for everything. It's for everything going on in their lives. We could be tremendous aids to them down the road. And the last thing, and there's so much more to say, but I don't want to hold people too long. The last thing is if we want to succeed with raising our children, we need to daven Takarish Baruch Hu. We need to daven. By the way, we could be amazing parents. And we could daven from today for the rest of our lives. Our children still have free will. We can never forget that. But we need to daven to Hashem that we should be doing everything. We should have the wisdom to do all the right things. And he should bless our efforts. And by the way, he should help us. He should help us that they should be in touch with the right people. My gosh, he should help us. They should have friends that are going to be good for them and teachers that are going to be good for them and they should be in a good position to deal with their challenges. The list is never ending. 
We need to dab into HaKadosh Baruch Hu for help. And we need to dab into HaKadosh Baruch Hu for help in ways that we don't even know. But that's okay. Hashem, please help me be a good parent. By the way, the, imagine as an exercise, not only in strengthening our belief in Hashem and strengthening our merits that our tefillah should be answered, but in helping my own focus. What I try to do, I, I can't do it most of the time because there are people staring at me wanting to know when I'm going to finish Shemona Esrei. But there are times where I'm davening Shemona Esrei privately. What I try to do, could you imagine not only A, davening that I should succeed with each child and naming them, but can you imagine what it is to talk about each child, one area, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please help me with this one in area X. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please help me with this one in area Y, etc. You know what that means? That means, first of all, that I'm really turning to Hashem and that I really believe it's in my hands. But you know what else it means? It means I'm compelling myself, at least occasionally, to honest to goodness think about my child in terms of what they really, really need. We're constantly going down the road in all kinds of ways. What an amazing thing it is to just reflect. So thank you very much. I hope this was a little bit purposeful, if nothing else, to realize that so many of us are in the same boat about these challenges, and maybe that it was helpful to realize that you're far better off a parent than I am. Maybe that's also good. Um, um, but uh, we should all be zocha. All of our tefillah should be answered. We should all be zocha to to grow together as parents. And thank you again. Thank you to Debbie and Leora for uh, working on putting this together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Rabbi. This was really meaningful. I think we've got a lot of food for thought. Uh, I also want to welcome Sarah Dolman to the, to the meeting. Uh, the Shomri Preschool was a, was a co-sponsor for this evening. Thank you all for being here. And please, again, let me know if there are other topics you'd like to hear addressed. Uh, and thank you, uh, Rabbi. I, I know I will be thinking a lot about things you've been talking about tonight. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. Take care, everybody.